All right, now that you know some of the basics about the cell membrane and its structure, we can look at membrane transport or cell membrane transport or transport through the cell membrane. It goes by lots of names, but the big thing I want you to know is that it can be broken down into a lot of either or type categories. So first of all, cell transport can be either passive or active, meaning that it can either require energy from the cell, often in the form of ATP, and be active, or it can not require energy from the cell. It could be getting energy from a concentration gradient and move down that concentration gradient and be passive. Passive transport also has two subtypes, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, which is an assisted form of diffusion. Simple diffusion moves straight through the phospholipid bilayer. So things that are diffusing simply, or sometimes we just call it diffusion because it's simple diffusion, those things are moving straight through the phospholipid bilayer. Simple diffusion of water through a channel protein we call an aquaporin has a special name and we refer to it as osmosis. It's just another type of passive transport. Facilitated diffusion means that those things, those substances, have to go through a membrane protein. And those membrane proteins, in the case of passive transport, can be channels or carriers. Moving on to active transport. Well, active transport also needs to move materials with the help of a membrane protein. But these membrane proteins act more like pumps, moving things against their concentration gradient and requiring energy from the cell because it's like fighting a current, just like you'd have to paddle upstream, but you could drift downstream passively. So these membrane proteins can be uniports. In the case of uniports, they're just moving one substance in one direction, or they can be co-transports, meaning they're moving two substances at a time, and those can move two substances in the same direction and be symports, or they can move two substances in different directions and be antiports. And there will be more on that in the next part of this lesson. But this part of this lesson is going to cover passive transport. So when we're looking at simple diffusion, we're looking at possibly one solute diffusing or two solutes diffusing, but we're always looking at movement from high to low concentration. Random movement of molecules is always going to result in this eventual equilibrium state. Equilibrium does not mean the molecules have stopped moving. It means the molecules are moving equally from one direction to the other. So it's no net movement, but there is still some movement. It's just equal in both directions. So what can diffuse straight through the phospholipid bilayer? Well, we're looking for very small, very nonpolar, or often nonpolar, things because you have to get through, or these molecules have to get through, those nonpolar fatty acid tails of the phospholipid. And so generally, this is the rule, small nonpolar molecules and water. But that membrane is fluid, so, you know, something else could always sneak through the fatty acid tails, but it is not very favorable. And so if you really need a substance, it's going to need another way in. So, why are cells small? Diffusion is important. Things diffuse through the membrane, needed materials like oxygen that the cell can consume as part of its metabolic processes. So, why can't we just be one giant cell? Well, it actually has to do with diffusion. When you're looking at three different cubes of three different side lengths, surface area is going to be different for each of them, and so is volume. What's important is the surface area to volume ratio. The surface area to volume ratio of a one centimeter cube is larger than it is for a two centimeter, and that's larger than a three centimeter. So the trend is the smaller the cube, the more surface area you have for any unit of volume. Well, 
if things are requiring the membrane to get into the cell, they need a lot of membrane for any unit of volume. So the amount of cell membrane for diffusion is greater per unit of volume when the cell is small. So cells must be small to stay alive, to allow diffusion of all the different materials they need, most of which require some sort of protein. And those proteins have to have access to membrane to exist. So now we get into osmosis specifically, which again is just a special term for the diffusion of water. Water is moving through a channel called an aquaporin. And so here's what you need to know about osmosis before we begin really talking about osmosis. First of all, any solution is a mixture of solute and solvent. So you need to know what a solute is and what a solvent is. A solvent is a dissolving agent in the body that's water. A solute is the substance being dissolved. So we're going to talk about osmosis in terms of water and the solute concentration. What's special about osmosis is that water is able to diffuse and reach equilibrium even when large things like sugar cannot. So here we go looking at some actual cell examples. First of all, zooming right in on just an example of a membrane and why water moves from high to low, or why even water is lower when there's lots of sugar around. Water is polar and it's going to stick to things. And so we're really, when we talk about high water concentration, we're talking about free water molecules. Those that are not necessarily associated with another ion or another molecule. So the free water molecules are much higher on the left side than they are on the right side. So if water moves from where it's highly concentrated to where it's only present in low amounts, you're going to actually see the water move against gravity until it balances out the sugar concentration because only then is the water at equilibrium. So in cells, you have hypotonic solutions, and these solutions are named for their solute. So hypo actually means low, but we're not talking about low water, we're talking about low solute. Isotonic means same, so same amount of solute in and out of the cell. Hypertonic, like excessive, this is excessive amounts of solute outside the cell versus inside the cell. So all of this is a comparison. Where is the solute greater and where is it less? So in a hypotonic solution, there is more water outside the cell than there is inside the cell. It's the same in isotonic and there's less water outside the cell than inside the cell in a hypertonic solution. So in the case of a hypotonic solution, water is moving in and it will burst a blood cell and it will make a plant cell turgid or put turgor pressure on that plant cell like I showed you before. Isotonic, it's equal movement, so no net change in water concentration. And in hypertonic, the water is moving out. And so that's going to be bad for both plants and animals, it's going to dehydrate the cell. And this is exactly why they tell you not to drink salt water, because it's actually going to pull more water out of your cells than you end up hydrating yourself with. So, to recap, hypotonic solution, hypotonic environment, ideal for plants. Our cells prefer an isotonic solution, which is why when you, heaven forbid, have to go into the hospital to be rehydrated, they're not going to put you on pure water. Um, or if they gave you an IV, that wouldn't be pure water. It would be a saline solution. Same thing with your contact lenses. It's all made to be in balance with your cells so that you're not dehydrating or excessively hydrating those cells. Facilitated diffusion is still diffusion. So we're still moving from high to low concentration. It's still passive. 
But this is a way to move polar substances, large substances, so your ions, your amino acids. You're consuming ions and amino acids all the time, so their concentrations are probably going to be lower in your cells all the time. So diffusion makes sense. They just need a way in, and so their way in is through facilitated diffusion. So there's our channels and our carriers. So just to go a little more into detail with some examples of these, gated channels are just like any other channel protein except for they can be opened or closed. So all channels are specific to a particular ion or molecule. All channels allow only one thing to enter but if they're gated they can respond to signals so they can only let things in sometimes if a particular signal is present and sometimes that signal is actually voltage so cells can respond to changes in electricity So voltage-gated channels, like this potassium channel here, respond to changes in what we call membrane potential, and that is the difference in electrochemical charge on either side of the membrane. And so this is especially important to nerve cell conduction, which I will cover at the very end of this lesson. All the parts of this lesson, not necessarily this part of this lesson. And when we're looking at carriers, it's a little bit different. Channels don't require any binding of those ions. They just, you know, they have structures that kind of attract that ion away from the water that it's engaged with, and it can, you know, move it across the membrane. Carriers actually bind their substances. And so that binding, very much like an enzyme, initiates a shape change in the carrier protein and the shape change ends up dumping the target molecule on the other side of the membrane. Still moving from high to low but in this case it requires binding to move that molecule across the cell membrane. Carrier proteins just like enzymes can saturate so the more the, the higher the concentration gradient difference. So if you have a lot of sugar or amino acids on the outside of the cell and very few on the inside of the cell, they're going to move fairly rapidly through these carrier proteins. But there is a limit. Channels can be open and things can flow very quickly through them, but carriers must change shape and that requires time. So you would see a relationship where with increasing concentration the rate would increase, rate is here, but you'd reach a certain concentration, you've seen a graph this shape before, where it would slope off and slow down. And that's it for our passive transport lesson. Active transport should be coming up and then a short lesson on nerve cell signal conduction which will bring all of these pieces together.